My name is Carrie Walker, and I will be facilitating the Village's health presentation on the next steps after a diagnosis of memory loss, cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, or a related dementia. Please keep in mind that this presentation is designed for educational purposes only and is not intended to take the place or substitute for advice from a healthcare professional. Today, we're going to take a look at practical actions that you, your family, and friends can take now in the short term and later. We're going to be learning about an acronym called HELP, H E L P, a four step approach to navigating next steps after a diagnosis of memory loss. We'll be talking about and discussing tools and resources that you can implement every step of the way. At this point, if you or a family member have received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, that is not changeable. But how the disease will impact you and your, your family's life and friends is largely dependent upon the next steps that you take. So I'm glad that you're joining us. Before we go delve deeper into how we're going to handle this, I want to show you a brief video clip that gives us a peek on what's going on in the brain. Alzheimer's, the race to the cure. Alzheimer's scientists are racing to find a way to prevent or treat the disease before it steals another generation. And they may be getting close. They know they have to improve on the current drugs, which do help with some symptoms, but don't actually stop the disease. They think the best hope is to try to stop the formation of the Alzheimer plaques. These plaques are composed of sticky protein fragments called beta amyloid, formed by accident when a natural brain protein called APP somehow doesn't dissolve in quite the right way. Think of APP proteins as glass bottles that need to be recycled after each use. But something goes terribly wrong. Just before they get melted down, the bottles are broken into sharp, sticky pieces, beta amyloid fragments, which then form into plaques. Many scientists think that if they can interrupt that process or clear away the beta amyloid, Alzheimer's disease will become a thing of the past. There are several possible ways to achieve this, and already a number of drugs are being tested for safety and effectiveness. They're also testing other common drugs to see if they might help with Alzheimer's. The problem is that all of these drug trials are extremely time-consuming and expensive. Because Alzheimer's develops so slowly, it takes a long time to see if a new drug is doing any good. You may be able to help. For information on how to get involved in drug trials, go to www.aboutalz.org or call 1-800-438-4380. Thank you. I think that video does a good job of explaining that what's happening in a loved one's brain that has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia is a physiological problem. The disease spreads in a specific pattern from one part of the brain to the other. And as it spreads, those plaques spread from different parts of the brain, depending on where the plaques are and what the responsibility or function of that part of the brain is, is going to determine the outward signs and symptoms that you see. For example, the disease first impacts the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain responsible for short-term memory. That it would explain why maybe perhaps one of the first symptoms that you've noticed in your loved one is a change in short-term memory. They're not able to remember that you told them that their doctor's appointment is at 2 p.m. and they keep asking you. Or they keep telling you the same story over and over. But this little video clip should really confirm that those types of changes in behavior are beyond their control and are related to changes that are happening in the brain. I'm going to walk you through a four-step model called HELP. H is, stands for handling the news. How did you receive the news? How are you processing that? How is the person with memory loss processing that? We'll move on to engaging. It's important to gauge, engage others as you navigate this course. 
Having support and help from others will allow you to help your loved one remain independent as long as possible. L is for learn. There are so many things that are now being discovered about this disease and how it affects the brain that are very helpful to know and can really change how the disease is impacting the person's experience. And finally, P is for planning ahead, which will be a summary of your next steps. Handling the news. If you think about it, a lot of other chronic disease conditions will enable a person to still remain largely independent through large stretches of the disease process. For example, if a person has COPD, has multiple sclerosis, or even cancer, if that person is still able to navigate the disease process mentally and to make arrangements for their care, for example, calling for a ride to a doctor's appointment or even scheduling their doctor's appointment, even if they're unable to be ambulatory and move around, they can still remain largely independent. However, Alzheimer's and other related dementias affect a person's ability to understand what's going on around them and to make some decisions as time goes on. It would be helpful if you had a couple of, of project managers that you could turn to to discuss what's a symptom of the disease versus something else. If you are a member of the Village's Health and have a primary care doctor in the Village's Health System, a resource that's currently available to you is to reach out to our Dementia Coordination Specialist, Melissa Denham, at that number listed on the screen. She's a certified dementia care specialist as well as a nurse and can guide you about next steps and, and field you to immediate resources that you might need. We are piloting an eight-week dementia support program in which the person with dementia arrives to the care center with, the, with their care partner, and each of them attends a different group. The person who is caring for the loved one with dementia will attend an education slash support meeting in which they will meet other people on the same path as them, experiencing similar situations, and they will be prepared of, by a list of topics and things of what to expect so that they can make plans. The person with memory loss will have an opportunity to participate in a movement therapy class that will work with their, their physical well-being to provide a relief of stress and coordination prob programs, which will help them navigate the changing disease process. I would encourage you, if you're a member of the Village's Health, to also consider reaching out to a behavioral health counselor. Oftentimes, if your spouse is your best friend and is also that same person affected by the memory loss, your support system may have gotten cut in half. So it's helpful to have somebody else that you can reach out to and share those feelings with. If you're not a member of the Village's Health, the Alzheimer's Family Organization is a local Alzheimer's organization available in this area. They have social workers, they have support groups and uh, provide education about the disease process. The Alzheimer's Association is a nationwide organization and has a massive website that will give you access to online learning, a list of support groups in the area, as well as has a 24-hour free hotline that you can call at any time to, to talk about things and develop strategies. When it came to handling the news, of the diagnosis of your loved one or yourself? How did you process that information? How did you feel when you first learned the diagnosis? Some people actually have been so overwhelmed that they really can't take in any uh, additional information. It's not unusual to leave the doctor's office and then think about a million questions you wished you'd asked later. Some questions that I wanna make sure that you have answered as you move to the next step is how did the physician diagnose the, the disease? Alzheimer's is, and dementias are diagnosed by a series of exclusionary tests. The brain is very complex and there's a lot of different conditions that can be contributed to memory loss and confusion. And we wanna start at the top with your primary care doctor and make sure that each of the other possibilities outside of Alzheimer's was eliminated. 
and that you feel comfortable with that diagnosis. Another helpful question to ask is where does that doctor feel that you or your loved one is in the disease process? By having an idea of early, mid, or later, it'll help you navigate what you have to do now and prioritize what's most important. Lastly, consider asking the, the physician, will you be the one still in charge of managing the care? Whether it was a neurologist or a primary care doctor, make sure that you know who's the, you're gonna be your project manager to be suggesting upcoming appointments. Who's your go-to person in terms of scheduling next steps? It could be uh, that the doctor has, is no, it's no longer going to be your primary care doctor and will not now be your neurologist, but make sure to clarify that. The other part of handling the news, unfortunately, is considering stigma. I don't think anybody would disagree that if we suspected we might have signs of cancer, that we would be contacting a doctor immediately and coming in for a diagnosis to determine whether or not that was the case. When it comes to memory loss, a lot of us are still not comfortable with coming, making that a public declaration. Oftentimes there's stigma, things are misunderstood about what's happening if the person has a choice in the changes in behavior. I would encourage you to think otherwise though. If you um, remain quiet and don't help seek the help that you need at an early stage, you could be limiting your access to certain drugs that might be able to help you manage some of the symptoms in the early stage. You, may be you might also be losing out in the ability to participate in the clinical trial that might be able to advance the needle on research and finding a cure to be able to give your loved one the feeling of sense of purpose that he or she is making a difference in finding a cure. You will also be um, cut off from other families going through similar things. It's very helpful to know that what you're experiencing is, nor is normal. And as we'll talk about later, by having partners or new friends that completely understand your diagnosis because they themselves have someone with the diagnosis, you can um, partner with them to continue to go out in the community and do things that you've always liked to do or that your loved one still wants to do to be independent without having to worry about the person wandering off or not being able to or navigate. This next slide is a text message representation of an interaction that is all too common. How often do we take friends and family up on their offers to help? In the text message, someone says, I'm really going through a tough time. And the response is, I'm sorry to hear about that. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Those let me know if there's anything I can do responses are well intended, but rarely followed up on. If we don't think about things ahead of time and come up with a list of things that people can actually help with, with chances are good when we are feeling stuck and we're in a crisis, we're not gonna know who to reach out to, or we're gonna need a lot more help than we had intended. So I'm going to suggest a tool that you might not have helped, thought of before. It's called a care calendar. Take the time when you receive a diagnosis to make a list of all the things that you might need help with. This could include general items of care, such as taking somebody to a doctor's appointment. But I want you to also consider what did the person, what was the person responsible for that has memory loss? What tasks in the household were they responsible for? For example, if my husband received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, I know that he has been the primary bill payer in our family. He has all the passwords and account and account usernames. So if he received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, I would have to entertain the idea that that is a task that I might now have to take on. And there's probably a lot of those tasks that I might have to take on. For example, he also does our lawn care. He is in charge of maintaining our automobiles. So if he per is able to do less of that as time moves forward, I need to have a plan in place to determine if it's not gonna be me that's caring for those items, who is it going to be? So start making a list when you have time to think clearly. Include things that that person with memory loss likes to do. 
if it was, for example, um, if it was a wife and the wife really enjoyed her time take, getting a pedicure done, um, she enjoyed going to this, uh, one of the squares to listen to music. That was something she savored every day. Maybe she'd enjoyed going for a walk right at sunset. As the person with memory loss is able to do less, you will have to take on more as a caregiver. So again, by listing some of the things that your loved one really enjoys doing, you can reach out ahead of time and perhaps ask some of his or her friends to help with those activities. By having a list, an objective list ahead of time, you can then list these events online in a care calendar and send them out to your friends. Oftentimes a person is reluctant to reach out and offer for help because they really don't know how they can do that. Or perhaps you don't feel comfortable asking them at the last minute, but by using a neutral platform as an online caregiver, a care calendar, you will be able to get people to help sign up for a multitude of tasks. I will share the example of Roger and Lucy. Lucy received a diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's, meaning that she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease before the age of 65. Roger was a con her husband, a consummate businessman. He decided immediately to go into action with a business type approach. He uh, opened up an Excel spreadsheet and began listing all the things that he might need help with. He also um, elicited the help from friends and family that knew Lucy to contribute to the list of things that he might not think about, such as that pedicure. He came up with a, a comprehensive list with items from small to large, things like to help to take the dog out, um, any of the tasks that he himself had been responsible for that but might, might not be able to get to now that he was caring for more for Lucy. He had a list of two spreadsheets long. Some of the items, like I said, were small, but some of them, such as a off a casserole once a month for dinner, but some of them were more involved, such as coordinating care and taking um, and coming over to sit with, with Lucy if he needed to attend to business items. The other advantage of a, having a care calendar is you can plan ahead to schedule items on specific days of the week that always happen on that day of the week. It can get very hectic and chaotic when you're having to navigate um, unexpected doctor's appointments and needs for another person. So the more stability and regularity you can maintain on your calendar, the better. For example, Roger knew that their son would always come over on Thursday nights and sit with Lucy. Their son would make dinner and spend time with her. So he used that Thursday evening to go about and do errands that he needed to do or to simply take a walk or get away if he needed to. So again, a great resource that will help you. There's all types of help and support that you might need. There's practical help, um, help with paying bills, help with getting information. Also need help planning activities. If your loved one can no longer do the things that used to keep them occupied and that they enjoyed, it's important to be able to help walk them through new things that they might like. It's difficult to think of these things in the moment. So I encourage you to start getting on websites and finding out different web ways to vary favorite activities. For example, if someone used to love to horseback ride and they can no longer horseback ride, perhaps you could find a friend that could take them to the stables. They could just walk in the barn smelling the, the hay and watching the animals. If that was no longer a possibility, perhaps they could watch a movie about horses or see videos of their horses. And then even entertaining thoughts about having a coffee table book that has horses. Again, if you can think about all these things ahead of time, you'll have things on hand as the person's getting agitated or frustrated that they couldn't, they can't do the, the regular versions of the activities they like. You'll be well prepared. Emotional support is something you might not have thought of. Usually when we go into a caregiver mode, we start picking up balls that the other person's dropping and then just adding them to our plate. We keep juggling everything, um, not even giving a thought to emotional support. So it's good to build that in, at least as a checkpoint, um, to have someone to talk to on a regular basis. Whether it's a friend, a person that knows you both, or, or a behavioral health counselor. Gathering information is another support that you can 
that you will need. There's a lot of uh, different ways that the disease affects the brain and how that looks on the outside that are things that you might not have thought of. If a relative is out of town and not able to get here or help financially, they can help you with research. At the end of the day, remember that this is something that it was not planned. It's not necessarily fun by any stretch of the imagination. So it's probably not unlikely that you might get extra tired, you're not sleeping, you're anxious. It's not unusual that you might wanna take a nap in the middle of the day. That's okay to do that. It's okay to ask for help. Similar to starting a new job, if you know nothing about that job, you're going to have to ask for help and get resources because it's something that you haven't faced before. There's, you don't have a blueprint for this. Again, it's very natural to feel frustrated. You don't have all the answers and you haven't done this before. It's also okay to feel lonely sometimes. The relationship with your loved one might become compromised because they're not able to communicate in the same way that they were before, and you will be left feeling lonely. So it's okay to take a nap, ask for help, feel frustrated sometimes, and even feel lonely. I want to take a moment to suggest that you do an activity at home. This will help you engage people. I want you to take out a piece of paper and write down all the top priorities in your life, everything that's important. I'd like the care partner or the care person to do that as well as the person with memory loss. Each of you needs to have a list of top priorities that are important in your life that you want to keep there no matter what. It could include lists of things like spend time with grandkids, walk the dog, listen to music, um, Skype my grandbaby once a month, um, whatever it is, play golf, list them all. Because then the idea is we are going to take a look and see how we can retrofit those activities so that the person with memory loss can still continue to enjoy them to some extent as well as how can you enlist the, as a care person, enlist the help of others volunteering to help um, care or take your loved one to different events so that you can still maintain your top priorities. Obviously, your life is gonna look different and you'll have to give up some things, but I think it's valuable to uh, first prioritize so that we focus on what is important and can make decisions accordingly. After you've listed those top priorities on one sheet of paper, I want you to flip the paper over and write down everybody that you can think of in your social network, everybody you know. It could include family, friends, um, people from your church, people from different social groups, from activities. List everybody down there. Even if someone is not a close friend, but is a member of, of the Mahjong Club that, in which you play every Thursday, if they live nearby, they might you might be able to reach out to them and, and ask if they could pick up your loved one on, on their way to that game. They don't necessarily need to know them all that well. It's just something to consider. If you're like me, when you're looking at that list of um, social contacts, it may occur to you that as you've gotten older, that network has shrunk. That's completely normal. I want to recognize that as you and your loved one progress along the path of memory loss, it's possible that you might lose some friends. Some friends are not able to handle the changes and may not be comfortable um, being around you as the disease starts to impact a person's ability to communicate. Again, perfectly normal. But rest assured, you will continue to meet new people, especially connected with any Alzheimer's related programs that understand firsthand what it's like. I will tell you the story of two different families, husband and wives, that were completely different from each other. Under normal circumstances, especially due to cultural differences, they probably never would have met each other. But because they were coming to support groups, they met and they developed a friendship. When one couple could no longer drive, the other couple would pick them up and take them to the support group. They would even drive across the entire county to pick them up. They were able to take trips and vacations together. Because if you think about it, if you have a loved one with memory loss in the early stages, you can remain independent, still going out to dinner and enjoying activities out in the public. But what happens if you need to use the restroom 
and you can't take your loved one with you. You might get apprehensive that they might wander and as a result decide, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. But what if you had one of those other friends that had a loved one in a similar situation? The four of you could go out together and you can help each other watch out for that other person. No one needs to know the difference. Engaging um, meeting, if you are a member of the village's health system, you have the opportunity to participate into that eight week dementia support group that I mentioned earlier. You'll meet other families with loved ones with memory loss. You'll learn coping strategies. Person with memory loss will also meet other people in the same boat that they can sympathize with and share feelings with. In addition to that eight week program, you will be have access to ongoing care consult consultation with that dementia team. Once you've gone through the eight week program, we're piloting a brand new alumni group that meets on the first Monday of every month to provide a respite opportunity for the person with memory loss. And we'll continue to meet on the third Mondays of the month um, in which the care partner and the person with memory loss comes. It's again, an opportunity to stay connected with people that really understand and to share your feelings and check in. If you're not a member of the village's healthcare system, Another way to contact other families that are um, affected by the disease is reaching out to the Alzheimer's Association. There's online caregiving groups, blogs, and also um, support groups for people living with memory loss. You'll also be able to track down support groups um, that meet in this area. Alzheimer's the Alzheimer's Family Organization is a local organization and they have numerous support groups in the village's area. In fact, if you pick up the recreation section of the Daily Sun on the Thursday section, there's a whole list of caregiver support groups for Alzheimer's disease. Please keep in mind that a support group is not a one size fits all. There's very different groups because we're all so different. Some of them are for support groups of adult children pairing, caring for parents with Alzheimer's disease. Some of them are from, are from spouses. Some of them are more formal or less formal. Some of them even have a respite piece. If finding someone to sit with your loved one while you come to a support group is a challenge, a couple of the groups nearby have adult day options in which the person with memory loss can come along with you and interact with other people with memory loss and an activity while you are talking to other caregivers. It's important to think about these things ahead of time and not wait for a crisis because if you Anticipate that at some point you're going to need to reach out and talk to somebody. If you build that opportunity in, when it gets come, when it comes close to a crisis, you'll be able to have that resource to take advantage of, rather than waiting till after the crisis is over. Building your social network. Once you meet those people um, that are also impacted by the disease, I encourage you to make plans with them you'll find that you'll still be able to go out and do many of the things you like to do because you can kind of help each other keep an eye on the person with memory loss if you need to step away. You'll be able to continue to go out to dinner, listen to music, go to church. You can even alternate driving. The more you can stay connected with your life as you know it, the better your emotional health will be and the easier the path will be to navigate. We're next going to the L for the learning step of the model. True or false? It's normal to be hesitant or resistant to learning how the disease will progress and impact your life. It's important to remember that it's possible you might not want to learn more about this information. Learning and educating yourself about the disease process, how it affects the person's brain, and then how that looks on the outside and the changes that are occurring them is essential to being prepared and able to make important decisions with a clear head. But since this disease has an emotional impact, as you're navigating through these facts and figures and learning about what to expect, it's probably not uh, beyond considering that you might be, uh, become sad, become angry, and you're going to want to shut down. Sooner is better than later, so begin the process of educating yourself about what to expect and developing a checklist or road list, a roadmap, 
sooner than later. But just consider what you're able to handle at any given time. Reaching out because of you and took advantage of the, the E step and engaged with other people, that will help you as you begin the learning process. The benefits are huge in terms of educating yourself about the disease. At an early stage, when you begin learning about how this disease will impact a person's brain, you're able to, you'll be able to involve the person in making legal, financial, and long-term care plans while they have capacity. We all want to have a say-so in what our life looks like at the end. If you haven't already had these conversations, take advantage of the time you have now to find out what's important to that person. Some of their responses might surprise you. Take time to reevaluate your priorities. What are the things given the, the diagnosis that are, are important now? Has it changed some of the priorities? Perhaps it isn't, it isn't as important to repaint the house as it is to maybe spend time together and take a little vacation. Set goals to accomplish while you're still able to. Then involve the person in fun things and their bucket list that they might want to accomplish. Typically, Alzheimer's changes occur very slowly over a long period of time in a person's brain. So by starting early to have these conversations, it will, it will help to make the path a lot more palatable. You can also discuss available treatments and medications with your doctor. Many of the drugs that are currently available to help with Alzheimer's symptoms only work in the early stages and they can make quite a difference. But if you wait too long, you might lose that window of opportunity. Um, you'll be able to recognize, by educating yourself, you'll be able to recognize symptoms of the disease either before they happen or as they're happening, so you can put in systems to adapt to these change and develop coping strategies. One of the biggest impacts of this disease on an individual is their ability to communicate. We largely rely on words and language to communicate our thoughts and our needs and our wants. If we are unable to do that, oftentimes we'll, we, we will become frustrated. Our needs are not able to be met if we can't clearly communicate what's wrong or what we need. So by preparing yourself for this ahead of time, you can help make sure the individual has the things that they need. I like to tell the story of what would happen if I developed Alzheimer's disease and my husband had to care for me at this early age. Since he's still working, it would be a, a possibility that he would have to get me up and get me dressed and ready in time for a caregiver to come and, and um, keep an eye on me for the rest of the day. Well, let's suppose that he got me up early and he got me in the shower and he even managed to wash my hair. It smells so great. He dressed me. He ha uh, we got to sit down at the table and have breakfast, and he's thinking it was um, an amazing day. What he might not recognize is, yes, my hair is washed, but I hate having wet hair. And I really don't like having my long hair down my back. So now here I am sitting at the breakfast table with wet, long hair down my back. That is really irritating me. It's also possible that he doesn't realize how much, how much I hate having chapped lips. He didn't bother to put chapstick on my lips. And he didn't use that, that um, anti-aging moisturizer that I like so much so I don't look so old. Of course, he ignored the chin hairs, had no idea how to pluck those out. So with all this going on unbeknownst to him, it's possible that day in and day out, one day I might become so frustrated with his care of me that I just push his arm away while he's trying to help me wash my face. Now on the outside, if he hasn't um, educated him about my loss of communication and how that might be creating frustration on my part, he might just assume that I'm becoming combative and that he can't take care of me and he might need to place me in a home. But as I just explained, he was able to understand my needs for my moisturizer and my chin hairs being plucked and putting my hair up. He might be able to develop that into a care strategy when he's getting me ready in the morning that would keep me happy and relaxed and not agitated because all those needs were being met. It's important to build a care team that understands your current and future needs. Maybe having a friend that comes in and helps, for example, with me, helps get me ready in the morning and, and do, does the female things that he's not comfortable with doing. 
It's also important that if you decide that you want to participate in a clinical trial, that you begin to um, educate yourself about those now and what might be available. Alzheimer's, a message for newly diagnosed patients and their families. If someone in your family has recently been diagnosed with possible Alzheimer's disease, you're probably feeling overwhelmed right now with worry and responsibility. Please realize that while the burden is a heavy one, there are excellent resources available to help you and your family navigate these choppy waters. First and foremost, of course, is your doctor, who should help you understand what your diagnosis is, what it means, how to treat the symptoms right now, and how to reevaluate the diagnosis as time marches on. Another important step is to seek out legal and financial experts who can help you with estate planning, power of attorney, and long-term care insurance. These arrangements are critical. It's impossible to overstate the importance of getting one's affairs in order before the illness progresses. And finally, there's a wide network of social services available to help your family with financial, physical, and emotional support. With the help of others, you can learn more about this disease, find the right doctor, join a support group, get the caregiving help that every Alzheimer's family needs. Please let your community help you face this challenge. For specifics on how to find the right services in your area, go to www.aboutalz.org. That leads us to planning ahead. This list on the slide is a culmination of a lot of different things that you'll be needing to consider. Perhaps you've already addressed some of them just in your normal end of life planning for you and your spouse or your, or your um, loved one. But if you haven't, it's, it's critical that you uh, turn your attention to that. Unfortunately, a person might lose their ability to make safe decisions and you'll need to make sure that you've already had some of these conversations. Contacting a dementia support specialist is helpful because they understand how the disease will impact the person's brain and will prompt you to prioritize certain items above others. In terms of uh, medical and financial powers of attorney, because a person's ability to communicate and to understand might be compromised, it's critical that you have those pieces in head pieces in place ahead of time so that if you need to step in and support the person and help them make these decisions, you already have all that paperwork in place. Um, attending legal to legal and financial matters if you haven't done so, including family members in those conversations could be helpful. Make sure that you, re, um, you continue to treat the person as a person instead of the disease. Oftentimes, when we become anxious or fearful, we start treating the person as a result of symptoms rather than our loved one. Don't forget to talk to them about what matters most to them. It may be different than what's important to us. You want to also make sure that you're addressing safety concerns. A person's ability to perceive their environment and to perceive what's a danger and what's not can change. Um, shampoos and different Things like cologne can look like something that's tasty, especially the different um, very fragrant, fruity types of lotions and creams that we have. Those can become things that can be consumed. So by working with a dementia uh, support specialist or someone else um, on the with the Alzheimer's Association or your primary care doctor that, or, that's familiar with how Alzheimer's affects the brain, they can help you identify some of the priorities to look look at. You want to make sure that you're also considering safety options in your home. Are there any guns that you have on site, firearms or weapons? As a person perceives dangers differently or perceives the environment or what's happening differently, it's possible that they may misinterpret um, what's going on and may engage a firearm when is, they shouldn't. So you want to take that all into consideration. Driving is another um, item to look at. You want to make sure that the person is safe. And if, um, if they're being impacted by memory challenges, that you have some plans in place.
to compensate for the fact that they can't drive themselves anymore. When you're planning ahead, you also want to include scheduling in self-care. Oftentimes, we don't even know what self-care is. You want to be able to interject small periods of joy, some things that make you smile. Could just be something as simple as lighting a candle, petting your dog, spending time with your cat, going to the Humane Society and spending time with those animals, taking a nap. This can be overwhelming and you might not be sleeping if you're caring for your loved one in the, in the evening because they're unable to sleep themselves. So make sure you, you schedule time to take a nap. Perhaps that's a time when you've scheduled your um, son or daughter to come over and spend time with your loved one. While they're spending an hour with them, taking them out for a walk or, or doing something that they enjoy, that can be your scheduled nap time. Relaxing in a bubble bath can be wonderful, as well as simply buying some flowers, something that will cheer you up. My challenge to you, in order to practice healthy self-care, I want you to write down a couple of small changes that can make a difference along the way. I want you to identify one or two goals that you're willing to work on in the next couple of weeks. Once you have a checklist, it will help you stay on track. There's a lot of different emotional components to this disease as you're processing how it's affecting your loved one. And the more you have some one specific area that you can go to a list to keep you on track, the better. I would suggest obtaining a binder or creating a binder. You should have one place with all the information for your loved one that you go to. Things are gonna get hectic. You might find yourself forgetting some things. Did I make that appointment? Did I write that down? Where did I write that down? Where's that phone number? And by having a binder that's organized with all the different information pertaining to your loved one will really work to help you. So in conclusion, Diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, or other forms of memory loss is not an easy one by any stretch of the imagination, but by figuring out a healthy emotional way to make sure that you process the news, engage others to help you, learn about the disease so you can prepare for what to expect and what to anticipate, and understand what's happening from a person's perspective with Alzheimer's, and being able to plan ahead will largely change how the disease will impact your life and your loved ones because you are more prepared and have resources. I encourage you to reach out with any questions to the Villages Health Learning Center. We are happy to email out a copy of this presentation as well as other helpful tools such as a proposed checklist that you might find helpful.